Uh, thanks so much. So the first question that I have for the panelists is, how can we ensure that there will be uptake of the new NIH policy in the scientific community? And also from your perspective, what will success look like after this policy goes into effect? Well, I can take a stab at that. Um, so I, I would like to argue that this is not going to be driven forward by really a mandate. It's not going to be something like your mother saying, eat your Brussels sprouts because they're good for you. It's going to have to be because we've got a situation like with Brussels sprouts, where now restaurants make amazing Brussels sprouts that people travel to go and eat. So what we need is data management and data sharing tools that are that are compelling and that 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 really have uptake because they're very tasty or I should say useful. And so we need to infuse those data management tools right from the start. And that means we need to have DOIs for more than data, more than the protocols, and just all the tools, all the pipelines, everything that could capture. So we need to solve the data wrangling from the start, not some futile effort that right now is the way I think most investigators view it. It's something that's data banking that's done at the end of a study. We need a process that starts right from the beginning and that fosters discovery as the work is being performed. And I have two recent stories that give an idea, of, I think, of how to get that uptake. And one is that we just submitted a paper in which in the last month, we decided to add more cases and that made all the figures obsolete. Because Carl Kesselman had written some Deriva-based tools that captured our metadata, our tools, our pipelines, not just the data. It took an afternoon to recraft the figures that would have been more than four weeks of work if we had tried to do it, uh, you know, just our, the, the way we did it the first time through. And it was done by a new worker. So what we'd done is taken the data management embedded right from the start and unlike in session one, where people said, or somebody said, we can't expect people to share all and to be able to fully enable replication of the studies. I think we can. And I think that's how we really ensure uptake. And we, can, we did that, in fact. We, we went from analyzing the figures with the original data, then the new data, then the combined data in just a short setting. I can tell you one other story that argues towards this as well as last month, a new grad student was presenting a, a presentation about an experiment that almost worked, which is a nice way of saying it failed. And when people asked about it, they couldn't remember what the details were. And they said, you know, so, so one of the senior students said, did you enter the data into the data management system? And the student said, no, the experiments aren't working yet. And the students almost in unison said, the data management system isn't to archive perfect data. There is no bad data. It's to help us learn from our mistakes by capturing what we did. And that, that system then lets us now and in the future learn from the mistakes we've made in the past. So um, let me add to what Scott's saying. I really appreciate that perspective. And um, I'll begin a little bit with uh, a definition of success. We heard earlier the reference to data sharing being a norm, and that's, that's really where I hope we go, that it's a default practice that researchers willingly and rigorously execute um, with the help of the kinds of tools that Scott has just mentioned. So the question is, how, how do we get there? And researchers face a lot of trade-offs in their research process that have the potential to impact, uh, affect the impact of the shared data. So how can we facilitate good choices in the research process? Going beyond what to do and more thinking about how to approach it. Uh, so I have three ideas here that I'd like to uh, introduce. The first is how we conceptualize the data. We often focus in on data and sharing the data, but researchers actually talk more about a bundle of research outputs that include not only the data and the metadata, but also the methodological detail or the software to read the data. And that's great because it fosters transparency and open science, but it's really important context for others trying to reuse the data. 
So it would be great to kind of focus on the, the bundle of research pro products and what needs to be in that bundle in order to facilitate downstream impact. Um, and towards that end, I'd like to echo something that uh, Atul mentioned earlier, which is a really important principle in thinking about downstream impact is reusability. And there's a lot of research in this area. Um, as Bob mentioned, researchers often just are checking the compliance box when they're sharing their data and not really thinking about the, the element of uh, downstream impact. But the future users are gonna to need to assess the fitness of the data for the new application that they'd like to pursue. They need to evaluate the quality of the information that's provided and they need to know how to appropriately reuse the data. So it'd be useful if we really think about articulating what's needed for each of these functions. What context is needed for the, re the new researcher to understand the data source and what code is needed to ingest the data and to appropriately analyze the data. Uh, the third thing I would uh, suggest, and this will probably come up in one of the later questions, is, is really thinking about how we support adoption of a practice and how that practice grows over time. And most researchers really don't have a very mature practice and often their disciplines do not uh, have a data sharing culture. So they're learning from one another, from a mentor, from a colleague, and they're using trial and error to improve their research processes. There are also mid-career researchers out there that would like to pivot their practice, but they don't know where to start. So I think that there's a few things we can do towards that end beyond some of the things that were discussed in the last section. Uh, one, I think we need to be more strategic about how we help researchers start the, their practice, identifying a place that's low burden for them, that's, that's enough for their given field, and then later considering what the increments are for phase growth in that field. Uh, it's also helpful to focus specifically on the parts of the research pra practice where there's going to be the most benefit and the most burden reduction. So for example, uh, the planning, to, uh, which Scott just talked about, is really, really important. If researchers focus on how they're going to capture data, but they don't always focus on how they need to capture context, what are effective uh, approaches for documenting methods and codes and so on. Or in the collection and processing, Scott mentioned workflows and automation and pipeline. We're finding that as researchers evolve over time, they're turning to these things, but we don't really explicitly teach them to to researchers and they may not pick it up through their uh, discipline. Um, I think the third area that was discussed earlier is just how do you make data more visible and easier to uh, track downstream uses. We've found that most of the researchers we've talked to don't actually look to see what happened to their data um, and for good reason. There's not really very good information about it. There's not really good conventions about requiring citations and so on. So my, my main theme is how can we help researchers make choices that will maximize the potential reuse and impact of their data? Great, I, I loved uh, Could, could I just expand on one thing she said that I think is really key? And that is that the way that we're going to make sure that we get data that's worth sharing is to have the data sharing happen within the lab first. That'll make sure that we're driving all the processes, all the pipelines, all the protocols and everything else that we need to make that valuable. If we can share it in the lab, then there's something we're sharing out of the lab. And I think that's the standard that we haven't been applying thus far. Yeah. Yeah, Scott, I think that's a really good point. I really like your Brussels sprouts analogy as a way to think about it. Um, as a mother of small children who's always forcing them to eat Brussels sprouts, it's good to know that there's another way. But in particular, I, th I think that it's a really good point that like to get people to get on board with this data sharing um, mandate, we're gonna need a data, we're gonna need people to actually see value within the context of their own labs. And so those were some really nice anecdotes about how an individual lab can really benefit from from doing data management properly. Um, and Sarah, I just have to say like, like you, I'm a statistician and so I 100% agree with you about the importance of thinking about methodology and software as being part of what we're sharing in the data sharing process. Um, because so often somebody will just post their data online but the, the methods are sketchy and there's no software. And it's really sort of hard to imagine that that data could be of, of much use to anyone. So you, you're yeah. preaching to the choir, I agree with you. Does so anyone from the panel have any additional thoughts about this question? 
Well, I just want to make a comment. I loved Scott's metaphor about Brussels sprouts, but I'm wondering if we could just, if we could change it to cake. You know, we can have our cake, our data management, data sharing cake and eat it too, right? Uh, uh, might be more palatable to a broader range of audiences, but, but I absolutely agree. And I have also stories where um, having uh, planned well and shared with myself, I was able to do things of the sort Scott describes. And I, I think we do need more stories like that. Then I'll just say that in, in our research study, some researchers are actually doing the documentation for their own future use. And in a, in a side conversation, there was, uh, I believe it was Patty Brennan who was saying that, you know, the most likely future user of your data might be you. Yeah, and I, I mean, I experience that all the time where, you know, I get emailed like 10 years later about some detail of some paper that I published when I was in grad school. And like, you know, it's really important to have an organized system. I wish I could say that mine in grad school was better than it had been, but you know, live and learn. Yeah. And so uh, this, this leads us uh, nicely on to a, another one of the questions here. We're hearing a lot about um, the incentives and how to change behavior and how we can make it easier to change behavior for researchers. And so uh, one of the questions we have is, what does a, a modern laboratory need? Um, so tools and infrastructure in order to be prepared to make it easy, as easy as possible to implement this policy when it becomes uh, a reality very soon. So uh, could we hear from one of the panelists on that? Sure, I, I'd like to jump in on that if you don't mind. Uh, so I, I think, uh, the way I approach this is thinking about the notion of if we if we plan our work, we plan our data management and data sharing work, then we want to work our plan. And so I, I think something that, that we want to aspire toward is reducing the gap between protocols that people are implementing in their laboratories, which are, are probably fairly elaborate and are well known, and the data management and data sharing components of those protocols. So how so how can we reduce that gap and make these uh, uh, data management plans and data sharing plans, living documents. Well, one goal, it seems to me, in a, in a protocol is we want to capture who does what, uh, with whom, or with what, where, when, and how, right? We want to capture those components and their critical aspects of the research process. And so uh, on the NIH-funded uh, Play and Learning Across the Year project uh, that I'm uh, co-PI on, uh, we are em embracing video uh, as not only a tool to capture human behavior, so uh, mothers and their children playing at home, but also as a way to capture the research process itself. How do we recruit participants? How do we actually uh, uh, carry out other, other procedures in the data? And I think that, that while that this type of use of video can be uh, broad-based and uh, uh, is suitable for many forms of biomedical research, uh, bench research, behavior research. I think there are many clinical settings and so forth where uh, this aspect can be well captured uh, in a richer way than uh, most text descriptions and so forth. And then of course, the question becomes from a data management, data sharing plan, where can those video go? And of course, that's something that Databrary has worked very hard to do is to come up with a policy framework for sharing data with per permission um, and with restricted audiences of researchers. So I, I think we've shown that that is a feasible uh, effort. And with Play, um, our entire website um, is uh, devoted to showing our protocol um, while it's in process. So another tool I think um, uh, is the World Wide Web, an amazing technology, right, that has transformed uh, societies, transformed the economy, uh, transformed politics in many ways, right? So um, there are very uh, useful tools for researchers. Uh, Markdown is a, a very, very light way for researchers to white, write web pages and integrate video and text and so forth. Uh, there are web services like protocols.io um, and all of the, and these kinds of, of tools, I think, make protocols um, and sharing protocols quite, uh, quite straightforward and quite easy. So I, I recommend those. There has been several mentions throughout the presentation about computational notebooks. So whether they're whether you uh, like the Jupiter flavor or I, I'm a, a big fan of R Markdown. My I live most of my life uh, writing things in R Markdown, um, and these computate these tools, of course, allow scriptable workflows. Uh, that um, uh, make data management uh, integrated from the start. And then the final piece, I think, is, uh, are tools that allow researchers to, to, to reduce the gap between uh, working with data, where we work with data and analyze it, and where it's, uh, where it's ultimately shared. So that, 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 in other words, spreading the, the cost of curation, the human cost and so forth, across a research project. Researchers are curating and organizing their own data and analyzing it while, uh, while it's in process. 
And so this notion of active curation, which I believe the library scientists know something about, is something that we're trying to implement on play um, since it's a dis geographically distributed project. So people are uploading all of their materials as they go. And we're, we're using scriptable quality assurance pipelines. So as the data are coming in and it's all going into Databury. So when the project, when we're ready to share, we just push the button and there it is. And so that's it. We're trying to, to uh, ourselves see how well we can reduce these gaps in these ways. And, you know, we're learning a lot. We, you know, it, it's not a done deal, but I, I think these are directions I'd like to see laboratories go. Okay, so I'd like to follow up on, on some of Rick's points there because, and he, he made great points. Um, and I think there's really uh, two things that I want to say about uh, the data management in the lab. There's the, uh, the piece about well, how do I get stuff from the facilities, from the instruments, the file stores, the limbs. Nobody's mentioned limbs much, but it's actually pretty important. And that's, uh, and the long term preservation of those kinds of data stores. And then there's the team level cataloging. And I think these are two different things. So the cataloging, so that you're able to organize uh, the metadata, track the metadata, uh, get, get your uh, uh, research investigation sort of structured, do consent tracking and so on across all of those different stores. Because I think something that's coming through a little bit is uh, maybe you'll just be using one or two or three infrastructures and you won't, you'll be using many. You'll be using many different data repositories, many different data types. You'll be having a repository for your SOPs. You'll have a repository for uh, your scripts. You want to be able to pull all that together. And so you need a way of integrating that through a unified cataloging system. And uh, I, I've kind of I, I've built one of those things. And, uh, and when we uh, have our, our researchers, we have a lot of researchers who use it, you know, hundreds of projects, lots of uh, projects install it. The, the number one thing they want to know is where's the, the procedure? Where's the protocol? Where's the protocol that went with this data? Uh, and the other thing they actually want to ask is a second point, which is how do I manipulate spreadsheets? Because guys, let's come, let's come down to brass tacks. In the lab, what really matters, it's spreadsheets and scripts, because that's what really kind of fuels uh, the, the, the real lab, the real PI's lab. And uh, so for me, uh, one of the things that we also need to do is to think, where can we put in nudge points? So where can we spot in the flow, in the data flow th throughout the whole uh, research lifecycle from planning to collecting, to processing, to analyzing, to preserving, to sharing, to reusing, at which points can we put nudge points where we could do something a little bit improved that would help the flow of metadata and the flow of data around that. So for example, good quality templates that are actually adherent to the, uh, the expected uh, metadata standards that will eventually be in the place for the, for the deposition databases. Little things, little things like that will make a huge difference before we start kind of building great big um, um, infrastructures. And, uh, and a, a, a counter, um, example, or, uh, not counter, but it's kind of maybe a bit confusing, is when we built our cataloging systems for sharing, we made sure that we enabled privacy. So the way to get people to share is to enable them not to share. So uh, they feel comforted then. You know, I, you're not telling me that I have to put all my data out there straight away. No, you can have a kind of incremental uh, creeping kind of sharing policy. I share to my colleagues, I share to my peers, I share to the people in my collaboration, uh, but I don't have to share everything from the get go publicly. Because, you know, if, as soon as we start to do that, everybody gets nervous. Um, most data, let's face it, never gets out into, into the public. Uh, arena um, is just dumped. So, um, so, so actually you need to be able to have infrastructures and policies and uh, protocols that enable you to be able to have an incremental sharing policy in order to be able to encourage people to really have the confidence. And, uh, and I guess my last point would be, um, it's actually quite complicated. You've got multiple data sets, you've got multiple data staging in your pipelines, understanding your data flow pipeline, understanding your metadata uh, flow through the lab, out the lab, and between collaborations is quite difficult. 
you're off, you're working in the laboratory setting, you're working at the institutional level, you're working at the sort of public commons level with all the things we heard earlier today. That's a complicated setup. You know, just I'm trying to figure out where where does my data go now? How does it flow? How do I synchronize it? That's complicated. So we need to give people advice. And uh, one of the things we've uh, done in uh, our European e-infrastructure project, which looks after life science data in Europe, is set up something called the RDM kit. And it's basically a research data management kit written by researchers and uh, data stewards in the life sciences for researchers in the in the life sciences in their language, not in the language of uh, policymakers, not in the language of data repositories, but in the language of folks who are working in human data, folks who are working in plant sciences, folks who actually have to really do this. Fantastic. Any uh, comments from any of the other panelists on this particular question? I, I have a bunch of questions already, but I'm gonna hold my tongue because <laughs> other people to speak. Well, this is Sarah. I want to just uh, highlight something that Carol just said. It's, it's really being able to express uh, uh, procedures and what is helpful to do in the language of the researchers. You know, I've been working in an institution that has to uh, uh, attend to regulations, and they don't understand any of the language of the regulations, or even completing an IRB form. They may not understand all of the the language of the IRB form. So I think that's an important point that you're bringing forward, Carol. Yeah, if I could follow up that, uh, Sarah, one of the things that uh, uh, we've, we've done in this RDM kit is actually look out and find found examples of how, do, how was, were tools really configured in reality um, and be able to publish them to say, look, this is how this group did it. This is how that group did it. And to kind of build a kind of blueprint, a blueprint for research data management for different kinds of, of data and different kinds of, uh, of projects. And uh, because people learn from example. Um, so just telling them, oh, you need to use a data repository or you need to use uh, a, a protocol uh, library that's too abstract. Let's have a look at examples. And from examples, we can then say, that's just the kind of thing I am. I'm just that kind of person. That's my kind of project. I could do the same, maybe with some slightly different tools, but I, I can figure out how I could put that together so I could really do it. Yeah, I, I, I want to uh, echo that sentiment that uh, having concrete examples is, is critical, right? It, it, the, the gap seems so much larger until uh, we can see something that looks uh, like something we ourselves might do. Um, and I, I think something, this actually goes back to comments that several other panelists made. The, uh, it's, it's possible to share uh, data or materials uh, in a way that sort of checks a checkbox, right? So you, I could upload an uncurated spreadsheet and no data descriptions and so forth and sort of say, okay, I've done, you know, I've checked, I've met the journal requirement, I've shared my data, but of course it hasn't really improved discovery. And so I think that, that having examples of well-organized uh, data uh, products that can lead to future discovery, but are also feasible, right? Given the resources that researchers have, it uh, probably is, a, is, is essential for, for moving the, the needle here uh, and changing the culture in the ways we want. Yeah, I think you're right. And that's why I emphasize cataloging because I think cataloging is all about finding things. Otherwise you put something in a store, okay, that's it, it's stored now, uh, but you can't find it and you can't link it to anything else. So, uh, so actually thinking about cataloging and referring to Sarah's earlier point about cataloging in a project across the data objects, you know, that this particular data set, this was a workflow that was associated with it that actually generated it. Thinking in that kind of way, I think uh, that, that enables you to have a much richer description of what you're actually trying to do and a much more likelihood of you being able to communicate it to somebody else outside your lab or even to you later on. 
And I, I have one more thing, and I think this will resonate with Mark because I looked it up right before, um, is using services that allow sharing that have APIs. So this notion is if, if I can put my data in a place um, and then access it again for my own purposes, whether it's creating visualizations or analyses and so forth using APIs, then I've written a script, right? I've written code that I can give to someone else. And as long as they have access, they can get access to the same data and I don't have to move it. Um, and uh, so I think, think that's, uh, that's on my wish list of things for, for targets for sharing is that more repositories have APIs that allow researchers to interact with the data in the ways they want and share later. So that, that I think is uh, sort of a hidden, uh, has hidden potential uh, for uh, accelerating data sharing. And of course, those can be part of uh, the data management sharing plans. Uh, thank you guys for, for the um, really interesting insights there. And just to make sure that we have time for our, our last question today. Um, this one is really near and dear to my heart because I think that it's so important. And in order to sort of improve the way the data sharing is done, we have to start from our trainees um, so that they can do better than we've done. Um, so the question is, what are the needs around training and education for laboratories to successfully implement the new data sharing policy? Um, I'll take this one. Uh, I'll start anyhow. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen really quickly. Hopefully you all can see this. Um, so I'm really grateful to be on this panel and to be able to have this conversation with the folks um, who have previously presented and I echo and agree with all of the comments that have been made. Um, my perspective represents that of trainees and junior faculty. And although I don't run a lab due to the nature of the, the work that I do, um, I frequently engage with folks on the front line, so to speak. So what I'm often seeing, thanks. There we go. What I'm often seeing and hearing summarily um, has a lot to do with our research culture and thinking about what that looks like within labs, the graduate training programs, departments, and the university at large with regard to data management and sharing. So I'll speak a little bit to each of these micro and macro environments. Um, firstly, within labs, we know that the tone is set with the PI or by the PI and what they communicate as expectations and demonstrate as important to their research group. So some considerations I think we need to be making are where are the gaps for PIs for things like being able to estimate costs and fully understand the scope of data management and sharing from you know, things as um, far as evaluation of repositories, ensuring data security, licensing data, and other objects for reuse to most importantly, being able to clearly communicate and monitor their team. Um, whether labs have access to adequate resources to implement the new policy, things like tools, um, personnel, or the expertise that's needed to use those tools, and basically funding and time to cover um, those needs and to be able to integrate these practices where they don't maybe already exist. So without adequate resources, it's challenging for PIs to be able to appropriately set standards and expectations which define the lab culture around good data stewardship practices. Um, when it comes to graduate programs and training programs, I often ask, where's the formal coursework? And to my knowledge, few offer actual courses for credit on research methods, which could cover many aspects of this new policy. Um, instead, I think we believe that trainees will absorb good practices and habits from their PI in the lab, but that ultimately depends on the lab culture, as I explained a moment ago. And we know that that's not necessarily a guarantee. Um, trainees that I interact with are always asking the right questions. Practically speaking, they wanna know how they can automate their processes to avoid contaminating their work and, um, and human error. They wanna know, you know, what types of data should they be keeping? Where do they store it? How long do they store it? What's the best way to analyze and visualize their work? What do you, what do, you do with my, your negative results and how do they share and communicate this within the lab with their PIs and, brought, and broader groups? And sadly, one of the biggest challenges that I see is a lot of trainees trying to figure out how to go back and undo unforeseen problems with data curation over their, um, their research prog progress. So um, 
I think grad students and trainees are eager to adopt and learn new strategies for best practices for efficiency and rigor in their research, but often have to use their own time to piece it together and teach themselves. And self-guided learning is expected in grad school, but really can only get you so far because you don't know what you don't know. Um, so what I think we should start considering are ways to provide robust catalogs of thoughtfully designed courses, which would be useful for providing mentored and structured environments for learning good data stewardship and best practices. So a series of courses spanning the duration of grad education is ideal, which will allow for multiple touch points um, early on in the, in the training during those foundational years and also through the dissertation years so that trainees have opportunities to apply concepts in real time with their actual work. Um, and then lastly, kind of thinking about university, the university settings and departments, um, I think what we can do to encourage faculty and particular post and in particular postdocs and junior faculty is to support activities related to data management and sharing um, and incentivize those. We've kind of hit on this already, but thinking about ways to incorporate aspects of the policy as part of annual review and promotion and tenure criteria, I think is a strong um, incentive for implementation. Offering professional development opportunity, opportunities is also a great way to set a standard and expectation at the institutional level for all researchers. Um, and similar to how we have space on our bio sketch now for code and data sets to call those things out, it would be great to be able to honor metrics of other research objects um, besides just papers and grants, things like published protocols, data sets that have been shared and reused and preprints, um, creating more spaces for community conversations with our colleagues to be able to share the benefits um, that folks have had in engaging in these activities is probably um, a welcomed and natural way of promoting good practices. It allows us to hear and learn from our peers. Um, and lastly, it would be really wonderful to see some internal and external mechanisms of funding for awards to demonstrate um, excellence in data stewardship and data sharing and, and to see um, ways of rewarding folks who are taking the lead on these efforts, designing and delivering grad courses on the topics and finding ways to promote, um, protect researcher time to engage on these needs. So um, honestly, you know, people go where the money is. And so if we can couple these new mechanisms of funding um, with professional development and career advancement, uh, I think it would stimulate interest and compliance with the new policy. So in summary, I, I often wish to see PIs um, have the capacity to lead by example and emphasize the importance of um, data management and sharing, setting good standards and expectations for all of their lab, lab members um, that eventually someone may wanna use their data, but it's clear that PIs are often limited in resources, um, time and money in order to be able to allocate um, their, the resources that they have in order to signal importance um, and a priority in these areas. Formal training of our next grad, um, next generation of scientists ensures that lab culture is embedded early on and provides incentives as um, completed credits towards the degree. And then lastly, I, it would be great if there, were, there was a faster uptake on um, institutional standards and practices uh, for data management and sharing. And what I have been seeing is that some departments are kind of taking the lead and in initiative on their own in different areas of campus, at least at my university, but there needs to be an overall cohesion or cohesive model for everybody to kind of um, participate. So those are the things that I would recommend as far as um, how we can educate and train folks. That's great. I really, um, I agree with so much of you, with so much of what you said, Leticia, and actually in particular, the idea that we need to put our money where our mouth is. If we care about data sharing, we got to invest our time and resources into teaching grad students how to do this. Um, because it's unrealistic to think that all PIs are doing this well or that all PIs are, are teaching their students how to do it well. Um, I'd love to hear from any other panelists who have thoughts about this question. 
So since, since the funders were invoked, I guess I could come in and say, if I, uh, you know, um, provide some perspective there. You know, I, I think what I'm excited about is, you know, as a funder, I think the policy environment we're talking about is really great. I mean, we've seen such remarkable movement, even in this in this workshop, that I think we're creating the right environment. If we don't address the issues that Letitia, I think, touched on, we're going to, I think, have a lot of promise that's unrealized, which I think is really a, a critical issue for us to address. So, so on the one hand, I'm just, I'm really jazzed leaving this conversation around all the remarkable, but I'm just going to describe purpose-driven examples of share, data sharing, which I think really, I think are inspiring. I think the place we've really got to focus is it's that next outer ring of investigators who, you know, haven't been brought up in a in a culture of sharing, who who don't perhaps even know that they should be thinking about this and for whom it's not a discipline, but a, a real sort of a, a new area of learning. And so I think, you know, for me, the training, like Tisha pointed, it's got to start early. I mean, the example does need to be set by the principal investigators. But I think, you know, we need to go deep in with graduate students and fellows and really creating the training environment where, you know, I the way I've been thinking about it is really, you know, I was a molecular biologist by training and learned how to do DNA sequencing because I needed to do it manually back in the prehistoric era, era I realize. Uh, but, you know, it was something you had to learn in order to be able to do the work we were doing. And I see this as a similar discipline. I mean, this needs to become a discipline as part of an, an investigator's worldview, and that starts early. I, I also think there needs to be some reskilling of of existing investigators, and this is where I think the funders can play a role of, you know, NIH and others being able to create an environment where there is both the development early, the reskilling of existing investigators, but I think the other training aspect is also really focusing on creating the cohorts of investigators who can be part of the collaborative environment so that not all biologists have to necessarily become data experts, data sharing experts, but they know who to work with to be able to, to, to achieve their, their shared objectives. And I think, you know, emphasizing the team science approach we need, you know, not everybody can be Steph Curry, I'll, but, you know, a few of us can be Clay Thompson, if we like, and, and you know, play alongside. And, and I think that just is, you know, something that we, I think, when we think about the workforce, really start thinking about the teams and the roles we need so that we can be more effective rather than try to create everybody into a, a robust data scientist. But it does start with the mindset of data sharing and knowing that you need to do that. And the last thing I'd say, you know, from a fund from a funder's perspective is I just want to come back to that really important role of training up and starting early with the culture of the benefits of data sharing and establishing the norms of um, I'm, I'm going to call them punitive tools for those individuals who don't, you know, share because, you know, we've had in, in my, I'm sure, in the MS field and other fields, Unfortunately, too many examples where important bodies of work were hindered because of a lack of data sharing. And I'm, frankly, the challenge we face is the funders have not had the will to actually take a punitive approach of you know, closing off funding for individuals who did not even follow the norms of the funder. Uh, I think today was a good example where we saw the FDA issue its first what I think is one of the first efforts of a non-compliance warning to a company that failed to deposit you know, data properly. I think that's a great signal step, but I, I do think there needs to be, you know, I'm, I'm definitely all for more carrot than stick, but there does need to be some consequence for individuals not living up to norms uh, and for mentors, you know, not, you know, creating an environment that is supportive data sharing. Uh, and, you know, I think we need to also really I think just ultimately as the funders need to play a role in creating the formal infrastructures that we need in order to do this. I just don't believe we're going to be able to be successful with individuals doing learning how to do this on the side. It's got to become part of the formal development. Otherwise, you know, we'll always be bootstrapping. And I just don't think we'll be, I don't think we'll be as realized as everyone. So lots of structural issues. Uh, to address, but I think what I am optimistic is there's so much good progress that I do believe we can just, you know, we can keep moving forward and, and I think we will be successful. Tim, I just want to say, I agree with all of your points, except for the sports analogies, which went way over my head. Um, but right. I, I also agree with you that the punitive tools um, 
there are punitive tools that are going to be needed because we can't just rely on carrots. Sometimes there do have to be sticks and people do have to see their, their consequences if they um, say that they're going to follow the requirements of a funding agency and then they don't follow it. I just don't see how this can work without the possibility of punitive tools. Yeah. One, one of the challenges though that we've got is that we're in a world of unfunded mandates and arbitrary budget cuts and uh, grant budgets in order to spread the money further. And this really does deserve to be uh, supported. So we put two postdoc equivalents salary-wise into building the tools and one postdoc equivalent into maintaining the tools. And it's worth it. It's way worth it but it's only worth it because we were able to, to muster the support for it. If we didn't have that support, I think we'd be doing a very shabby job of it and we wouldn't be seeing the benefits. And so I really do believe that we need to make sure we're supporting this. If we say it matters, and if we say it's important, we'd better be supporting it as a community and as funders. No, I think you're right, Scott. I think this in the conversations we've had with I've had with peers in the funding space, you know, this is one of those areas where we like to say and everybody should share, but then in our grant funding rounds, we actually, you know, don't provide the resources for investigators to to actually fulfill what we tell them that they should be doing. And I mean, I know within my organization what it costs to just manage data. And we just are not sufficiently um, supportive of it. So I think the, the challenge we face around that, right, is the budgets are, you know, budgets are, but, you know, resources are finite. And so it's just a matter of how we make choices. And, you know, I think it, it's a both and proposition that I think we need the scientific community to be with the funders when they make choices about providing infrastructure and actually getting the peer review committees to say, yes, these infrastructure investments are just as important as all of those lab mice that we're we're funding and it's just a critical part. And I'm not sure we quite got the culture there. Uh, and so I think we need to do some work with it that. It makes the money spent on the lab mice actually more important and more useful. And that's the key thing, I think. Exactly. I think we'll take one comment from Carol and then we'll move on to Q&A. Yes, thank you. Um, I really wanted to make a, a plea for professionalizing data stewardship. I'm all for uh, being able to train up uh, folks in order to be able to do good data management and, and to uh, promote data sharing. But actually, it's a, it's a challenging thing to do data stewardship, uh, and particularly in any kind of significant sized project or a significant sized laboratory. The data flows are non-trivial. The metadata is complex. Um, so I in Europe, we're really promoting the idea of professionalization of the data stewardship area. And we are establishing train the trainer kind of activities in order to be able to get amplification effects uh, so that uh, we can kind of propagate best practices. And there's been quite a significant number of investments at the national and European level in that direction. And I'm not sure if, if that same sort of thing's happening in the US, but I think it's necessary. That's great. So I just now want to open it up to um, the Q&A. So thanks so much to, to those of you in the audience who've submitted questions. And the first question that I'm going to read out loud comes from Robert Downs at Columbia University. And this is a question that's really near and dear to my heart, because I think that so much of what we do as senior faculty is make decisions about um, how we can support and promote our colleagues and the promotion process. So the question is, how can we help promotion and selection committees recognize the value of data sharing so that those who create data will see the value of data sharing for their careers? Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I have I have kind of a crazy idea. I put it in the chat. So I think there should be a prize or prizes. I mean, and I'm, I'm I think the prizes should have cash. I think they should be prestigious. I'd like to see a big awards dinner gala with um, important speakers to come in and talk about um, how important openness and sharing is to uh, to the scientific effort and to public health, as we've seen. So I, I think if you if you if you put a spotlight on it in a meaningful way, people will pay attention. Now this is Sarah. I wanted you know to move this into promotion and tenure. We need to articulate. Um, the, the quality of the product that is uh, being produced, their contribution and the impact. And those measures are really 
not well developed at this time. And so I think that research needs to be done. And there was conversation in earlier sessions about this. I think the other thing is to get your department to talk about um, data sharing, sharing code. There's a whole host of other things that are not the classic single author paper uh, in the P&T process. And I'll, I'll throw in the, the Slido streams, some work that the uh, AAU and APLU, the higher ed associations are doing to get institutions to think about how they do culture change around data sharing and uh, open science. I guess, oh, go ahead, Carol. Yeah, so I, in my own institution has taken over 15 years to battle this one. And uh, we finally got uh, our most senior level management to change uh, their promotions and procedures so that uh, they take on board open science and reproducibility and uh, producing products that contribute to that as a promotable criteria. And that, I think, is really a significant step forward. We have a, a champion for reproducibility. We have a champion for open science who spends all these days making sure that they don't forget and to make sure that uh, the people who sit on those committees are uh, sufficiently well educated to remember too. Uh, and, and the second thing that we've done is infiltrate, infiltrated the committees with people who actually do understand this, who will be prepared to stand up and speak at those committees. Uh, because it doesn't matter how many policies you put in place, in the end, it comes down to who's in the room. It, I agree with Carol, it does come down to who's in the room. I think part of this is I do think we need to find, measure, you know, work to create new measures, new, new impact assessments, new accountability, the H index for data sharing. I like that. I saw that in the stream. Um, but I think it also goes beyond that to really, I think, beginning to also create the culture of like the, 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 the impact we are having for the broader community and not, I would say, Certainly, in in the in the healthcare space, you know the the impact one has for the patient community. For if someone is doing sharing clinical research or clinical trials, it's so many participants are are participating, and I think that's sometimes left out in the in the conversation about the benefit that one has for the broader community matters greatly, and yet is not quantified in these kinds of. Uh, settings. And I think, you know, it would matter to get the uh, other people in the room, such as the people affected by the data sharing to help, you know, asset, you know, provide assessment. Okay, so we have more questions. We have a lot of questions to get through. One of the one of the things that uh, struck me about all of this is, is grouping things into categories and understanding, you know, show me the incentives, I'll show you the outcomes. But where are we going to where are we going to put money and is it going to be in training? Is it going to be in curation or is it going to be in these big prizes? And I think one of, from speaking to funders personally, I think one of the gaps that we see is this idea that a lot of researchers will be making their data available to tick a box or to be transparent about their paper. But it, it, the message about reuse and what Atoll spoke about before about downstream innovation on top of data sets, I don't think that's being thought about by the researchers. And so we have a question um, that's come through from Alex Uzdevines, um, who's talking about the idea of paying people to do data management, which is difficult because of direct indirect cost problems. Um, and if we iron these out to allow investigators to hire data managers, yeah. Um, would that be the way to go? Because you'd be, I, I appreciate that uh, you can't have somebody in every lab maybe, but oh, maybe you can, but it's, it's a big expense. But is, is that the approach to be taken? So when this question has come up and I've talked to funding, uh, so people in funding agencies, um, I, the reply is you can always put those costs into your budgets now. And the barrier that researchers say is, look, my budgets are already tight enough. How am I going to squeeze um, costs out for something that is more important, right? Like, and usually, at least in my field, that would be resources devoted to collecting new data. So I, I'm not sure how to solve that. So there's clearly a difference of opinion about whether, whether those costs can be put in and whether they're valuable to put in. That, that seems to me to be the, 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 the point to resolve. So I, I think that a number of 
universities are starting to um, establish research data services and um, uh, the speaker, uh, I forget the name, but the speaker in the last session kind of outlined some of the things that uh, librarians can be taught to do. Um, but it, you know, if, in putting uh, funding for planning and preparing for data in your grant, it's a big chunk of money. So, um, so I agree with the earlier comments, I guess Scott made this comment that we really need to conceptualize it not as just a few dollars, but like 10% of the grant. Um, and especially if you have staff that you're going to have as part of your research collaboration, that that's a significant chunk of money. And that's where some of these research data services for the, the one-off services can be extremely helpful. Um, and I note that a number of libraries are, are uh, developing subject matter uh, data stewards uh, per Carol's commentary that will really help be able to work within the, the discipline. I think that's really important. I think there's an analogy here with the research software engineers. So uh, five or six years ago, there was no such concept. And now every university in the UK has a pool of research software engineers because we identified them and named them. They already were there. Uh, they just needed to be unionized. And, uh, and now we have such a pool in my own institution. They're also el elsewhere uh, throughout Europe. And this is a pool that you can draw upon in your grant. So you don't have to hire a full time data manager or full time research software engineer. You uh, contribute to the pool. So you ha have a piece of them at the point that you need them. And, uh, and I think that kind of collective activity that's being pioneered for the research software engineering community equally applies here to building a pool of uh, data, data stewards or data managers, whatever you want to call them. So you wouldn't have to sacrifice a significant part of your research grant, you would be buying into a pool. That sounds like a fantastic resource. Um, and I, I've heard of some institutions in the US that have something like that, but, but to actually have a, a job category is great. So I, I'm going to throw out another idea here. Um, what if there were incentives, say 10% of, of the total, uh, total award that, would, that could be added to a, a research project in the event of a, of a particularly well done research data management plan, research sharing plan, or a, a history of data sharing that's demonstrated from previous awards. So it's not we're taking money away, but you're giving people an incentive. It's a top off an incentive for uh, doing better, doing more in the future. These are a lot of great ideas and I, I'm sorry to cut this conversation short, but I do want to make sure we have time for at least one more question and possibly even two. Um, so the next question I want to ask um, is, is very near and dear to my heart as well. So how do the panelists suggest, how do all of you suggest approaching situations where authors are reluctant to share their data or may even refuse to share their data when asked? So certainly as a statistician, I've, I've encountered this when I've, um, emailed lab, uh, the PI of an experimental lab asking for data. Um, sometimes people just say no, even though there might be a statement in the publication saying that data is available upon request. There could even be a statement in the publication saying data is available at this website or at this accession number, and indeed it's not. Uh, so what, what, what's going to happen in that case, and how is this going to get solved? So as a funder, I can tell you we've had painful experience of this where you know, as part of a project that we were trying to qualify an outcome measure, we needed a particular clinical trial data set, which was not within the US, was from another, uh, another part of the globe where the funder even had a policy of data sharing. And in, in effect, the investigators said, too bad, we're not giving you the data. Uh, and the funder tried to compel them to give the data and they thumbed their nose at the funder because they were a fairly prominent research group within a small community that the funder didn't really want to get uh, uh, sideways with. And so, so I think it does, there, it's a, to my point earlier, there need to be some framework for consequences that if an, indivi if an, or, if an individual or groups refuse to, to uh, you know, abide by norms, you know, it, it, either the funder has to refuse to consider their applications in the future or some sort of way to provide individuals you know, some consequence for failing to share. Because in this case, it, it hobbled the project for a few years. Uh, and there was literally nothing we could do about it. Uh, and it took a lot of begging, pleading, threatening to no effect. 
so I think part of this is about human nature, I think I'd say. And I made in the prep meeting, I, I made an observation to Richard that, you know, one of my observations is actually a place where I'm seeing in an adjacent sphere where there's actually considerably more openness to data sharing is actually within the pharmaceutical sector where there's quite a bit of robust sharing of clinical trial data. And I'm finding that in the academic sector, that's a, that's a cultural challenge that we actually just have to wrestle with. And that, that, that certainly was true in this instance. So before, sadly, I don't have a good answer for you other than, you know, more sticks and less carrots. You know, a lot of people complain about the journal uh, available on economy Quest and so on. But I, so I think one thing that societies and publishers can do is require that data are deposited in an open, openly accessible repository. Um, and if they need access controls, get, get it to a repository that has access controls. And then that takes it out of the hands of a personal interaction between the requester and the uh, provider. I think there's still got to be a level of oversight too, though, you know, we're going to put, have to invest somewhere and it's going to take some people power to make sure that those things actually happen. You know, there has to be a level of follow through for these expectations that we set. I agree with Letitia there that uh, it's essential to have the oversight. Uh, I was on a project where uh, the data was embargoed and then once the embargo period had gone, um, the data still wasn't available. And uh, so we, but we had put in place the governance that said, OK, in that case, the repository will just open it up because you signed that up when you put it in and you had to put it in in order to be able to continue to be awarded that uh, funding. So there it goes. And the world did not collapse, folks. Actually, it turned out there seemed to be quite a lot of collaborations in, emerged. So it's almost this kind of fear of um, if I, I will let my crown jewels out there. Well, actually, you know, you might find good new research if you do that. And after that, the second phase of that program, we didn't have those kind of problems. But it's almost like we had to take folks to the brink uh, to get them to see the opportunities. Even if we told them the opportunities, they really had to experience the opportunities before they would be committed. You know, I want to give a shout out to Chris Borg, uh, who um, was part of a team that wrote a paper on the producer's advantage. And one of the arguments in this paper was that um, because you have the knowledge about the data, even though you share it, you have the deep knowledge about the data for someone to use it. There's an opportunity for these new collaborations that you just referenced, Carol. So that's something I don't think we right. talk about very often. Right, right. And we found that a lot in our projects. In fact, we, uh, there was actually a tendency towards what we call data flirting which is where you write enough metadata so somebody knows that the data is there, but not enough that they can actually reuse it. So they have to take you on a date, i.e. write a paper with you, um, in order to be able to get hold of that data. And I do see quite a lot of data flirting in our repositories. That is a great point to end on because we are at time, but thank you so much for everybody's contribution. Thank you to it for everybody who contributed to the questions. Sorry we didn't get through them, but there's so much good stuff to talk about. We're going to hand over now uh, to Marianne and Richard to uh, close out the day, but thanks again to our speakers and thanks once more for attending.